I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Rob Klein. I am the host of Oral History Live, which is many of you know, is generously sponsored by our friends Mike and Esther Wilson. If you've joined me, thank you to them. We'll tell you no, we have sponsors. But of course, he has sponsors, so that's good. I, I also want to point out before we go too much further that he is easily the most prepared oral history live <laughs> guest ever. So I'm just going to sit here largely and let him tell you his story. But uh, be before we jump in, let me do just a little bit of introduction, though he's a man who hardly needs an introduction. This community has been blessed for as long as I can remember with some of the most amazing instrumental music instructors anywhere to be found. E even David Law. <laughs> <laughs> who was who we did that too we could find on short notice uh, but uh, but uh, there is perhaps there are very few I can say with confidence very few who are as legendary for their long service in this community uh, than our guest tonight Lumen Colton who uh, led you know I'm a Washington grad he, 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 he led a band that I admired without having to like it uh, for a long, long time over at Jefferson High School. So if you join me in welcoming Lumen Colton, we'll get started. All right, you want to start at the beginning? Well, I think my first line is to say, I, in the past, or on here, I have been best known is Steve Colton's dad. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Colton, who uh, had his last teaching years at Lindmar and watched that school system grow and excel, uh, I, I felt he went way beyond what his old man had accomplished. And That's another thing I, I, mean, I admire without liking. <laughs> <laughs> and at age 59, had one massive heart attack, which he did not see coming. He didn't recognize symptoms. But they were on vacation out of Yellowstone Park for their next year. And such a shock to all of us. But uh, I was certainly proud of Steve that he chose his profession and did so well. I looked at the things he accomplished and uh, tried to, uh, in some way, come up to some of them. And his wife is here tonight, Sharon. And uh, Sharon, after a long, long time of just teaching piano and, and uh, having cats for company, <laughs> yeah, uh, he got another husband. Just a year ago. Uh, so we're happy about that. All right. Let's you got to be careful, old man. They get to talking. I, you know what? I, I, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am prepared. So when we were talking on the phone, you told me that you remember the moment that you fell in love with music. Yes. Uh, uh, there was a time when uh, the New York Philharmonic Orchestra broadcast on radio on Saturday nights. And at that time, I was a junior in high school. I had heard about that. I tuned in to the program, and, and the first program I heard was an all Wagner program, which as an old trombone player, you know, I heard uh, things like the Overture to Tannhauser and the Right of All Curies and all those exciting pieces. And, and there I sat in the room with this radio in uh, 1937. And that to me, was a musical conversion. I decided at that moment, I want to be in music the rest of my life. This, this is what I enjoy most in school. And uh, 
I, I want to do this. So I always felt that that was a musical conversion for me. And uh, I, I went on playing the trombone. If, if you, you would have heard the way I played them, why, you would have wondered if that boy was going to mount to anything. But, uh, um, I, I did go on with it. I went to Cornell College. In fact, the Cornell Orchestra made tours in those days, and we got them to uh, play one of their concerts in our local gym. We, we sponsored them. And uh, there, there again, it reinforced my desire. And uh, so I went out for their auditions, and I didn't win first place, but I got a hundred dollar scholarship for my freshman year. And that, uh, that sure helped out with the total expense at that time at Cornell, board, room, tuition, music lesson, the whole package was $650. So that hundred bucks gave me a good start. In the summertime, I, I worked on farms, uh, some of them for two dollars a day. Yeah, you get six dollars for the week and, and your meals. So, so that's how I got my start. Now, you grew up, you were listening to that radio in, in that other state over in Illinois. Yes. Right? So I, what, what was it about, was it that the fact that the, the band came to visit your school, is that how you got hooked up with Cornell? Why did I go to Cornell? Because we were Methodists and our Methodist minister in the little town of Kirkland uh, was uh, semi-retired from Cornell and, and currently had a son attending Cornell. And when that son was home and visited, he gave me a sales talk on Cornell. He said, "Boy, if you want to go to a music school, in those days Cornell was a liberal arts college. Uh, it had connections with the Methodist Church, and uh, the Conservatory of Music was attached to the General Liberal Arts College." So you could get a music major, you were still going to liberal arts courses, but uh, the music building was separate and uh, had its own faculty. And it was good for me, small tomboy, to go to a, a school, which at that time, there, uh, I used this figure of 650 once before, but I think that was their their attendance right then of students. And uh, so So as you're so you're you're studying music at there at Cornell and there's there's a, an event going on in the world that needs your attention. You're you're, yeah. you're trying to get drafted out of school. So in my junior year I was uh, listening to the New York Philharmonic Orchestra broadcast on the radio in my room. And uh, they interrupted that broadcast with the famous quote from President Roosevelt, this, a this day shall live in infamy, mm -hmm. telling about the invasion and, uh, of the, uh, the Germans uh, coming with their, their uh, fleet of ships and hitting Pearl Harbor and so forth. And I listened to that and I thought, I wonder if that will affect me someday. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it did. We, soon after that, well, they <clears throat> gave college students a chance to enlist in the ERC, Enlisted Reserve Corps which was designed to uh, help them finish their college if the need was not too great for their enlistment. So I signed up with a bunch of others in the ERC. And uh, in March of my senior year, I uh, 
receive my call. <clears throat> Excuse me, my call to report to uh, Camp Dodge. And uh, <clears throat> it didn't say wait till the school year is over. <laughs> it said get down there on March 25th. And uh, so I had to bypass my senior recital, my final exams. Um, at the end of the course and, and so forth, but the college very kindly the next year at midterm graduation in January granted me my degree on the basis of military courses that I had taken in the meantime, so I didn't have to go back and make up that whole semester, and I was very grateful for that. I bet if you called them up, they might be play your senior recital. <laughs> I, uh, cutting my recital was a blessing for <laughs> It was going to be a vocal recital. I, I had taken trombone and voice. And, uh, those, those of them sung in choir with me like Bill Moss. <laughs> You know, it's no prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your service uh, during the war. What, what all did that involve for you? Yeah. So they called in this uh, enlisted reserve corps group. There were uh, probably a dozen of us from Cornell that went in at the same time. And uh, we checked in at Camp Dodge down by Des Moines. And um, then we're dispersed to various camps around the country, depending on our interests and background. And uh, I, I was sent to. Uh, um, don't look at me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says. Ken Kentucky. Yes, you did, uh, you did basic training at Fort Knox. Help me, help me some way. <laughs> At Fort Knox, yes. Fort Knox, yeah. Kentucky. I, I knew this is him. <laughs> At my age, and I'm not confessing, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that uh, in January I turned 98. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. My wife is here because one of the things I am losing is my memory for names, dates, and so forth. No <laughs> and there was an example. Thank you, Sharon. I thought Sharon And Sharon was there. is not 98. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. I, I assume Sharon was there to make sure I was properly respectful. <laughs> but, but perhaps not. Maybe it's to help with your memory. But Sharon was a nurse, and she enjoyed taking care of the elderly. <laughs> this was not a direction I intended to say. So why don't we return to the thrilling days of World War II? And uh, in your service, you're at Fort Knox. You get shipped, uh, looks like, to Arkansas, and then to New York, and then you go overseas. What were you up to overseas? Yes. I, uh, I went overseas in the last major convoy of World War II. By convoy, I mean a line of ships miles along, as far as you could see in any direction, there were ships, and, uh, and they had some protection. They had the battleships, they had, had planes when they were near shore to try and protect them from German planes, but by that time, the German planes were uh, were uh, were defending their own country, and the submarines uh, were were reduced in number. So here was this this line, and I was uh, on a, uh, a ship that they had requisitioned from the British, and uh, the main menu that they served us, we, we called Billy Goat Stew. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not a great treat, but 
And, uh, and on that ship, I made the mistake of taking my first salt water shower. Oh. First and last. <laughs> I hits the rest of the time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, after a, over a week on the, on the seas, then, then that the convoy broke up, dispersed. Um, the ship I was on uh, docked at Glasgow, Scotland. Um, then, then we got on a train and uh, went south to uh, <coughs> south, Southampton, England. So they were dispersing the people to various train centers. And then towards the end of, of your time there, the Army helped you further your music education. Is that, is that what I understand? They sent you off to Trinity College? Yes. Uh, this was after VE Day. The war was over. And uh, as a, kind of a, a goodwill gesture to the countries that they that we had occupied, why uh, they set up various study groups in different countries, and uh, you could apply for them. And if you were accepted, why you went free. So I applied for one at uh, Trinity College of Music right in London, where I was stationed. And uh, so for my last three months, I, uh, I didn't report to the Army. I, I had my rank of staff sergeant by then, though I was getting good pay, and uh, sending that home rapidly to pay off my college debt. Uh, did I tell you that I had to borrow $1,500 to get through four years of Cornell? <laughs> $1,500. I, I paid it off and, and I had $200 left to get married. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was in, uh, in London at that time, living in the, the same place. Was, I had a room in what is now the embassy, U.S. Embassy in London, if you would go there on Grosvenor Square. Sharon and I went back on, on a trip some years ago. And uh, where, where's this building that I stayed in? Well, there was a new building that had replaced it. And it's now the American Embassy. And uh, I had a room upstairs. There was a GI um, mess hall down the street a little ways where I got my meals. And, uh, but I had no army duties. That was what that, that GI Bill did for a few selected soldiers at, uh, as kind of a goodwill gesture. And I uh, attended Trinity College of Music. I took trombone lessons from the first trombonist of the London Philharmonic oh. once a week and voice lessons from uh, a gentleman who directed the Bach Choir in, in London, and uh, all all that for free for three months, and then uh, down to Southampton and uh, on a victory ship to go home. Now you, you may remember he told us that he wasn't a very good singer. It says here that you sang for a season with the Royal Choral Society. And as far as I know, that did not end our diplomatic relationship. <laughs> so you couldn't have been that bad. I should have asked this long ago, can you people in back hear me, understand? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, that's the blessing of having been a band director. <laughs> if you didn't get your message to the drummers, you were in trouble. <laughs> All right, so you come home on a victory ship, and it looks like you go uh, to you know a fine Big Ten school, not the right Big Ten school, but you go to Northwestern and uh, get your master's in music uh, and study trombone there. Anything notable about your time at Northwestern? Yes, <clears throat> I, my home was in central northern Illinois, little town of Kirkland, 
Uh, so I, I lived with my parents. I got out of the army in April and I, I worked in the local hemp mill for a couple months there to build up some money and, and, uh, and get some money so I could uh, get married to my girlfriend of some seven years on and off. And we, uh, we got together again. And then, uh, let's, let's see. I've lost my train of thought. Well, that's because you were you were thinking about your wife. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> well, what next? <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, so you graduate from Northwestern, and you start your career as a band director. Is that what in, comes in next? Postville. Yeah, that was a busy spring. I got in the Army at the end of April. I worked at the hemp mill for a couple of months. Um, going, going with Aline, the, uh, the girl from Rockford, and uh, we got married uh, early in June, and we both started summer school at Northwestern. Aline had been in the ways for two years. That was the uh, women's branch of the Navy uh, at, after the war, why they just called it women Navy, but uh, they, were, they were waves during World War II. And uh, so we both went to summer school uh, at Northwestern and, uh, and had, had our bills paid for both of us. And, uh, then the second summer, um, she didn't go to summer school. She stayed with her parents because she was about to have C. And that's, that's the way it happened. So uh, he was a Northwestern baby, and, and uh, many of you knew Steve. And uh, so we went to the town of Postville, and I. I taught there four years, and uh, in those four, the other three summers, I went back to Northwestern alone to summer school, finished up on my master's degree, and uh, then uh, following that, I applied for a, a little larger school, Denison in Western Iowa, the county seat <coughs> town of 2000. And we got that job, and uh, so we went to Denison for the next seven years. And uh, my last, uh, seventh year in Denison, <coughs> Cedar Rapids had just built two new high schools, Jefferson and Washington, and uh, I, I applied there, and uh, I, uh, I got a job in Cedar Rapids not at one of the high schools, but um, they had moved a lot of their junior high people into the high school jobs. And so there was a band director job at Roosevelt, which was becoming a junior high. And I taught there for six years. And then when the older man in Jefferson decided to get away from that, the active life, why, well, uh, I, I got the job at Jefferson, was there for 14 years. He says casually. Uh, <laughs> I was there for 14 years. Tell us about the band Blue. Tell us about your experience. At, 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 I remember vividly, it would have been after you had left the program, but you built the program so well that even those of us in other bands in the 80s knew that the band Blue was the band to look up to. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. It pained us. <laughs> it, was, it was difficult for us. Those were good, good years, and my three children all graduated from Jefferson. And, uh, Do you have favorite performances, halftime performances, favorite concert pieces, things you remember from, from your time at Jeff? Yeah. Um, I guess I, 
was showing still feeling my military background because my halftime shows often had a military team and a, or, or a patriotic team at least. I, uh, I wasn't a warmonger, a militant, but uh, I was patriotic. And uh, so we, we did patriotic teams with people like Lana Turner. <laughs> yeah, that's good to see some of these former students here. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then when the, uh, as, as the um, high school band life got more active and was a problem to me, my, my wife, Arlene, had an extended illness. Uh, she was a, a patient of bronchiectasis, which you don't often hear of these days. It's a lung disease. And no, she never smoked. That's always the first question that's asked. But uh, she had lung surgery twice, and uh, that was slowing me down. I needed to spend more time with her. So I applied for Wilson Junior High when it was open. And I spent my last few years there because it didn't demand so the uh, nights and weekends. And, uh, so, so that's how I finished up in, in Cedar Rapids. And so I'm, I'm interested in, in both sides of uh, your Jefferson time. So you're, you're in a junior high, yeah. you spend 14 years with the Band of Blue, and then you go back to a junior high. And I'm, I'm interested in, in your thoughts about the differences uh, when teaching younger musicians versus high school musicians. And, and frankly, how you could stand it right after junior high. <laughs> <laughs> well, the plus for junior high is enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> if you can channel that, you, you're okay. If you can't put up with that one, you better stay away from it. <laughs> of course, I, I think they're different now than they were then, too. Yeah. We're talking what, 30, 40 years ago. And, uh, yeah, I was teaching junior high before TV was a dominant factor in the home. Mm -hmm. And that changed things a lot. Why practice that instrument when you can watch TV? <laughs> Especially if if mother is working, yeah, and uh, so I was there at a good time. Did you find it hard to retire? Hard? Was it challenging to retire? Was it difficult for you to leave the profession? No, I was sixty-four and a half, and I thought I'm ready. <laughs> Junior high kids will do that to you. <laughs> my experience. But, but you don't just stop, right? It, it, it says here that you would have been running, coordinating the All City Instrumental Music Contest while I was playing in it with varying levels of skill uh, in the late 80s and through, through the 90s. So tell me about the, the All City Music Contest, which, raising my own kids in this case, <coughs> doesn't seem to attract the same number of musicians that I remember participating in it back in the day. That may just be me misremembering, but it was a big deal in our musical calendar, and I have to think that's partially due to your coordination of it. Yes, the All City Music Contest, I think, was somewhat unique to Cedar Rapids and uh, involved a lot of kids. They uh, depended on the director, some directors required every student in their band to play a solo. But uh, I kind of took a middle of the road. Uh, I'd like to have every one of you kids play in the contest, either a solo or play in an ensemble, like a quartet or a trio. And uh, they, they usually would accept that. And so we had a lot of participation. And we had some outstanding soloists like 
Lá na bolsa. <laughs> and so you're running that that contest. What does what does that involve in terms of organization? Like how many people did it take to put on the city music contest? Well, <clears throat> we ran as many as twenty contest centers uh, because we include piano solos. And uh, at its peak, there were probably around 10 pianos at centers. Now, by a center, I mean a room where a contest was going on. And uh, they, they were by grades. You'd have a, a primary center, and an intermediate, and a junior high, and a, and a high school. and. Uh, uh, they, they were judged accordingly, but uh, as far as the instrumental, why uh, their their ballot, their entry blank, gave their history and background, so the judge could look at that and see how old this kid is, how long he's played, and whether he takes private lessons. That was factored into it also. Mm -hmm. If uh, if he just mm -hmm. took group lessons, uh, why they were a little easier on him. And uh, if he had private lessons, they expected a little more. That's why they were hard. Private lessons. <laughs> I understand. Now, I've been make, waiting this whole presentation to make fun of Lumen's trombone playing, but I'm a saxophone player and we are very seldom allowed to make fun of any other instruments. <laughs> but I remember those contests so vividly and, and what how exciting and nerve-wracking it was to, to play for the judges and to have put in that that work mom would make me practice. And uh, and just what a, an important time in my development as a musician. So thank you for your hard work in that area. And and lessons, at, at, when I started giving private lessons in the late 60s, were, had just been raised to $2 for a half, less, half hour lesson. They'd been a dollar and a half. So they stayed at that $2 level for quite a while. <coughs> so uh, the teacher was, was making $4 an hour, which, <laughs> Bought a lot of groceries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's the, it's the mid '80s. You've retired from teaching. You're you're helping with the All City while well, you're coordinating the All City Music Contest. But but what else are you up to in the early years of your life? Well, I got into piano tuning for a while. I had a brother-in-law who uh, who lived in uh, Delaware because he married my sister who. After college, uh, married a DuPont engineer and, and was living in uh, Delaware. And uh, so when they visited and over the telephone, he kind of got me interested. He said, that'd be a good part-time activity for you. And uh, so then I took a three-week course at Shell Lake, Wisconsin. It was did. a music huh? camp same there, one, and the lady taught this. And so for, uh, I was a three-week wonder. In, in the army, <laughs> we used to talk about the young lieutenants being a 90-day wonder. <laughs> in this case, a, a piano tuner was a three-week wonder. And, uh, I, uh, I practiced first on the family, and then, then did the family's did piano. Something. I just want to be clear about that. He practiced on the piano. Family's <laughs> piano, but um, yeah, it uh, it was a good part-time income, and I enjoyed it. I, I met people that way. And, uh, once I got these things, my uh, life changed. Now, I don't, I don't say don't hire a piano tuner that has hearing <laughs> <laughs> because they have 
had really improved in technique for an awful lot. But the ones I had at that time, they, they just amplified everything. What you were listening for, if two notes were out of tune, you'd hear beats, kind of wall, 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 wall. When the walls went, it disappeared, the two notes were in tune. And uh, with hearing aids, you were getting the walls all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's our public service for tonight. Do not hire a piano tuner with old school hearing aids. Uh, I want to jump back to the early 1970s, a uh, pivotal time in my own life, uh, because I was born then. Uh, the, you were the president of the Iowa Bandmasters Association from uh, 72 to 73, and I know there's a Meredith Wilson story in here. Yeah. Yes, well. When I was president of the Iowa Bandmasters, uh, that was an elective office. Uh, one Sunday afternoon, I was out in my driveway washing my car. My wife called me to the phone, and uh, so I answered the phone. Uh, Hello. And uh, the man on the other end said, uh, Hi, uh, this is Meredith Wilson. <laughs> And I just about said, yeah, and this is Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> but for once in my life, I was smart. <laughs> and it was Meredith Wilson. He said, Renee and I just, just got back from abroad and through the stack of mail, I got your invitation to come and uh, be honored guest at Iowa Band Master Convention. And we had the nicest visit. He was just a friendly Midwestern guy. You know, he'd grown up in the Midwest. So that was my visit with Meredith Wilson. He, he never did come to the convention. He was, he was, and uh, he, uh, he didn't need the money. He was doing well. He's, yeah, he's still, right, well, and, and to this very day, his estate controls the usage of, say, the Iowa fight song and what you can and cannot excerpt from it. And so the Meredith Wilson estate is doing just fine. Yeah. And if you go to Mason City, like, they have this museum in his honor. I presume it's still open. Oh, yeah. Yes. With, uh, with all the artifacts of Meredith Wilson. He's just a good Iowa boy that uh, did things well. Rob, yes, sir. before you leave that point, Lumen and Steve were the first father-son IDA presidents in the history of, this, of the organization. Rob, you're like the Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr. <laughs> <laughs> and this, that seemed you better say I that again so they all, all heard it. So, not the joke part. So let me make sure I have this right. The first father and son to both serve as president of the Iowa Band Masters. Is that right? That's yeah, pretty dark. I think the only one, I think. Well, so that's why hmm. after that uh, term of office for Steve, well, I, I would introduce myself as Steve Colton's dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can tell that now, and he, and he would he would just laugh at the rest of you. But Steve was a kid, I had to practically whip him to get him to practice. <laughs> you know, he, the poor he, man is not here to the He'd be in his bedroom, he, he shut the door to his bedroom so his two sisters couldn't pester him, you know? And then it'd get quiet in there. So I went and take a look. He was reading Mad Magazine. <laughs> you remember that magazine? Yeah. Mad Magazine. I said, okay, Steve, I'll take that. <laughs> he had literary aspirations. That is important to American literature right now. <laughs> All right, I've been leading you down this primrose path through your, your life, but what, what highlights have I missed? What else would you like to tell the assembled masses before we take questions from them. You have time to hear all the things I did wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that question is a trap. <laughs> I'm going to say no. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> maybe just one. <laughs> yeah, we, we would guess if you have one thing to get wrong. I got one. <laughs> see? Uh -oh. She says, I have one. So, we were chatting, uh, Lou and I, at the gym the other day. Sharon had wandered off somewhere. And we were uh, talking at kind of old times. And he uh, played with the Eastern Iowa Brass Band for a few years. And then he said, but I had to go because I just couldn't handle two jobs. I was marrying Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> She can reach him. So I'm going to smoothly transition to say you also spent almost 30 years in the Cedar Rapids Municipal Band, right? Yeah. And you're still serving on the concert, the Cedar Rapids Concert Association board. Is that? that true? Not anymore. Oh, oh they, they kicked you off the board? <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I just resigned from that. Oh, she resigned. I felt I aged out. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things I could say, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I don't think you aged out that to my non-aging is right here. My nurse wife feeds me well and, and uh, makes sure I get my eight hours sleep. And, and she drives for me now. Yeah, my family was relieved when we came to that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and on that note, are there questions? Yes? I don't have a question, but Rob, I think it would be nice to see a show of hands how many of Lumen's former students are in the audience. Did any of you bring your instruments? <laughs> Are any of 13. you still playing those instruments? Uh, yeah, you still, how many of you are still playing? <laughs> David called me out earlier for not playing because I sent my saxophone to Wichita with my kid. But he's a saxophone performance major and playing the horn appropriately. Uh, but some of you are, are still playing. This is such an amazing tribute to an educator, right? To, to yeah. have, well, one, just to have you in the room. But Rob. secondly, that some of you are still playing. Are you, are you pl are still playing trombone? Uh, no, I, I I gave my trombone a year ago. I gave my trombone to a repairman, and I said, uh, when you run across some kid in junior high that would really like to play and uh, doesn't have the money for a horn, give it to him. Oh, If you're not playing trombone, what are you playing? Bass clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> I think saxophone is slightly higher than bass clarinet on the, on the make fun of instrument list. <laughs> you play bass clarinet, and also you were you helped out the percussion section in the in the Muni band, is that right? Yeah, I played the uh, bass drum in municipal band for a few years. Frank Pearsall came to me. One time after rehearsal, and he said, uh, the, some of the band members are really complaining that <laughs> whoever they had playing bass drum did not keep a steady beat. He said, how about you? Can you keep a steady beat? <laughs> and I said, well, try me out. We'll see. And I thought, don't have to keep a lip, up a lip on that instrument. <laughs> So then I, I played the bass drum for Frank Pierce Hall, and uh, he, he was a good director. He was uh, easy to follow. And, uh, I'll bet you and I were, were possibly briefly in that band together. I spent a 
summer in that band. And as, I, as I recall, yeah. the, the, we kept time. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Okay, I've got a short Lumen story. All right, I love it. <laughs> when I was young and foolish, I sent in a reel-to-reel tape for an Iowa Bandmasters performance and got accepted. And I turned that letter over to Cheryl, so it's in the, the archives, and it was signed by Lumen. And years later, I asked him, I said, do you remember that band? And he said, yes, I do. A little 1A band in the middle of, he said, you were the only band that had French horns. <laughs> and that was fine. I was happy that that was, that was just fine. <laughs> do we you, played that summer, or it, played it, that spring. In general, do you want to be remembered for your French horns? Well, my license plate says French horn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept that letter for quite a while. Finally, I thought, I better get that to our IBA historian. So Cheryl has that. And Ken Michael's signature's on there, along with yours. Yeah. I love it. an old trombone player, I used to have people say, oh, are you still letting things slide? <laughs> <laughs> I feel really good that I didn't tell that joke. Okay. <laughs> uh, other questions? You want a story? Absolutely. About well, I mean, that would well, probably be best. Right. I was at Roosevelt with them. I graduated with Steve, so we were in the same class. They lived in Cedar Hills. I lived 26th Street between Cedar Hills and Roosevelt. We had to be there 7.30 in the morning for band practice. And I'd be walking down Johnson Avenue, and all of a sudden this car would slow, just slow, honk, honk, and then take off. It was him! And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> But you've always been my idol. Oh, that's the sweetest. I do. I do remember once at a parent conference when I think I had the right answer for a change. Uh, this young fella came up to me, uh, looking kind of kind of angry about something, and. Uh, he said, Mr. Colton, what did I do to get a D in band? I said, nothing. <laughs> Or that you might give to younger band directors like David Law <laughs> about your your career and your passions. Well, something that you really enjoy, something you that you feel you have a little ability in. Let's see what when, when I was the age to start on an instrument. Um, this, um, I'll tell you my beginning story. Um, in the middle 30s, or early 30s, yeah, my dad lost his job. Dad was a good worker. He was a manager of a small grain elevator feed shop, which was kind of out in the country, uh, north of Rockford. And uh, when things were getting tight, the owner of that group decided, I've got to save a little money. I'm going to run the place myself. And so he let my dad go. It was nothing he'd done wrong, but uh, the owner took over to save some money. And uh, then, uh, 
It was about that, that age, uh, in fifth grade, that, uh, yeah, I'm losing the train of thought. Again. The band director, wherever you went to, to play an instrument. See, that's what I have her for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot what this story was leading up to. Well, you, you were going to talk about your, your first band director, I believe. And, oh, and, oh and yeah, okay. Now, now I know. Okay, so, so we had to move a couple times in that period, but my dad was out of work. And uh, <laughs> I, I remember the uh, uncertainty, the shame that I felt when... My first grade teacher went around the class and uh, what does your father do for a work? Mm -hmm. And I had to say, he's unemployed. You know, mm -hmm. that was, but um, it was, so it was a little later than that, around fifth grade, that uh, we finally moved. My grandfather lived in Genoa, Illinois. And uh, he had first built a small house the family lived in. And then it, as he <coughs> was able, he moved that across the street and built a bigger home that they lived in. Well, but he had rented out the small home. It was a tenant home. And uh, when my dad got out of work at that time, my uh, grandpa said, you come and now I'll, I'll let you live in the tenant house. And he very kindly told the uh, people who were there, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to have family here, so can you find another place to live? Because they were just paying rent. And uh, so we, li we lived in, in that house across from Grandpa for a while. And uh, the funny thing, the uh, town, Town line, the border to Genoa, uh, was just beyond my grandpa's house, but uh, this house across the street was in the country. And so for the first time, we had to go to the country school a mile down the way, where the town school was closer up this, this way. And, uh, but, uh, about the band director. <laughs> and you wanted to join the band in fifth grade. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's what they have you for, thank you. <laughs> uh, they, uh, yeah, then, then we moved. After that, he got a job in Aurora, Illinois, which was a bigger town, and uh, not as big as it is now, but uh, ma managing a uh, chicken hatchery. And uh, I was in fifth grade then, and <clears throat> they had a, a band director at that school, that grade school. And uh, his name was Paul Yoder. Now, if you band here, oh, oh, they would know that name. Yeah. I, I presume Paul Yoder was just out of college. That was his first job teaching the grade school. And uh, I said, oh boy, here, here's a, a band I've been wanting to play. So I got a friend to take me in to see Mr. Yoder. It was before school. He was in his office sitting there writing music. And this man wrote hundreds of band compositions and uh, writing music. And uh, me, clothed me, I was always un undersized, and, and uh, uh, I, I was shy at that time. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I went up and, Mr. Yoder, I'd like to take cornet lessons. He looked up from the piece he was writing, just looked at me, no, got too many cornets. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was that. He didn't tell me he had a baritone sitting over there or some other instrument. But uh, 
That was fifth grade. I was a sophomore in high school before I went to a school where I could get to play a horn. Wow. Those were depression days. We were moving. I, uh, cause I, I had moved to a county seat town, Denison, Iowa, a county seat town of 2000. They didn't have a band anymore. They had to get rid of it because they couldn't afford it. And this was in, in the 30s, you know. And so uh, they, they hired a local piano teacher who came once a week and had a uh, girls' chorus. That was all the music they had in that school. But uh, anyway, I was a sophomore in high school. Dad got another job back in this little town of Kirkland. And here, here's a town of 550. But the man who taught band there lived in Rockford. He, he played in a dance band on the weekend, and he taught five days a week in four different towns. <laughs> One day in the town, and in the biggest town of the, the four, he taught two days. And uh, so I went into him, and uh, his name was Roy Hubble. See, I still remember him. But, uh, there, there I was, a sophomore in high school, and I'd had some piano, and, uh, and I said, uh, well, he, he had had an aunt and an uncle of mine already, because he taught there a while. And uh, he said, oh, yeah. He said, what, what would you like to play? I said, trombone, but I don't have an instrument. He said, could you pay fifteen dollars for one? And I said, "No, I'll, I'll scrape that up." So the next week he came back, got one at the music store, fifteen bucks for a trombone, and, <laughs> and it worked. And uh, I started with yeah. him, and uh, that, that was the beginning of my playing in the sophomore year. Wow! So I saw Mister. Uh, Roy Hubble in later years in a band convention mm -hmm. and I just gently mentioned to him, well I've seen you before, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to start and you were too busy. And he said, oh. <laughs> yes, that would have been, been Mr. Yoder, right? He yeah. was too busy to get you started. Mm -hmm. but, but Mr. The, the gentleman, Mr. Humble? Humble. Oh, okay. Yeah. Roy Hubble. He and, his, he and his brother had a dance band. They played on weekends, Saturday and, and sometimes Sunday afternoon. And, uh, that's how they made their living. And he, get, he got, um, I, I mean, my dad was on the school board, so he, he said they paid him $50, $50 a day and uh, he uh, had his own, own transportation you know, to drive from Rockford to that town. Wow! So he was a, a dedicated educator in the in the same way that you became. Well, trying to make a living. Well, <laughs> that's important too. Yeah. yeah. So so Lumen mentioned a moment ago that uh, he always was undersized, but I think we can probably agree that his legacy in the musical world, particularly here in the state of Iowa, is oversized, and it has been. Despite my warrior leanings, it has been my great pleasure to talk to the architect of the band of blue. Please join me in thanking you. We should once again thank Mike and Esther Wilson for sponsoring this program. If you are not getting our weekly e news, which is written, with just a sharp and brilliant copy of my <laughs> Some fellow with a microphone in his hand. You really should be getting it because then you'll know about all of the programs that are coming up. So please join us uh, on our website, become a member of the History Center, and come back for the next edition of Oral Histories Live. Thanks very much.